It's here. The route for the 2024 Tour de France has been unveiled. Two time trials, eight flat stages, four hilly stages and seven mountain days, totaling 3,492 kilometers with 27 categorized climbs along the way. There's also high mountains as early as stage four, a mini Strada Bianchi before the first rest day and a finish that isn't in Paris, but in Nice. The Tour de France fam Avec Zwift will venture outside France for the very first time. It begins in Rotterdam on its way to the iconic Alpe d'Huez. Stay tuned to find out absolutely everything you need to know about both races. Let's start with the men's and we already knew that they'd be starting in the Emilia Romagna region and it's in Italy that they'll spend the first three days. It's the first time that the Tour de France has ever started in Italy, making it the 11th country outside of France to host a Grand Depart. Due to the Olympics, next year's Tour de France starts a week early and so stage one is on Saturday 29th of June. It goes from Florence in Tuscany over to Romini on the Adriatic coast. And at 206 kilometers with 3,600 meters of elevation gain, it's even longer and tougher than last year's opening stage in the Basque Country. There are a total of seven classified climbs en route through the Apennines. And so whilst the start and finish are flat, it's unlikely to get the sprinters particularly excited. However, the last climb peaks with 25 kilometers still to go. So it's also not particularly likely to be a GC battle. If this stage was sat somewhere in the middle of the race, it'd be nailed on breakaway day for sure. But coming on stage one makes this one very difficult indeed to predict, which is of course, exactly what we like. Stage two has far less climbing in terms of altitude meters gains, but the sprinters won't be any happier when they take a closer look at the parkours. 200 kilometers from Cesenatico to Bologna with six short punchy climbs along the way. The last of those two are up to the Basilica de San Luca. It's 1.9 kilometers at 10.6% and used at the Giro dell'Emilia each year. Primoz Roglic won there back in late September and also won when the climb was used at the finish of the opening time trial at the Giro d'Italia back in 2019. No doubt then, the Bora Hansgo leader will be salivating at the Italian openers. On this occasion though, the stage won't finish at the top of the climb. There'll be a bit of a plateau with another short uncategorized climb before plummeting quickly down to the finish line in Bologna. This to me looks like a fantastic stage. You really can't beat short, steep climbs for making a race explode. The third and final stage in Italy is another long one. The longest of the entire Tour de France actually at 229 kilometers. It heads westwards out of Piacenza into the Piemonte region and finishes in Turin, which will already have hosted the finish of stage one at next year's Giro. Despite the three classified climbs, this one looks like it will finally provide the sprinters with a chance. The race then remains in Italy for the opening kilometers of stage four, starting in Pinerolo. If the race hasn't been interesting enough already, which I highly doubt, this is where it gets even more interesting. The riders climb to the ski resort in Sestria before taking on the Col de Lauteray and the Col de Galibier back in France. They'll rise to over 2,600 meters altitude here on stage four before descending into Valois. A big, big day for the GC riders early on. The Tour last finished in Valois in 2019, where Nairo Quintana won from the breakaway and Egan Bernal dropped the GC riders to begin his ascent to yellow, reeling in, of course, Julian Alaphilippe that year. So, following a brief visit to the Alps, the Tour heads to the flatlands, and this is surely the section of the race which will appeal to the sprinters. Stage five concludes in Salvoba, which is regularly used at the Tour de Lain, and occasionally at the Dauphiné too. The recently retired Nasu Buani won here actually at the Dauphiné in 2016. Another chance for the sprinters follows on stage six, which concludes in Dijon. The tour regularly visited the city in the 1970s and 80s, but hasn't been used as an arrival town since 1997, where Mavio Traversoni won after Bart Voskamp and Jens Hepner up the road were both disqualified in their two up sprints. On to stage seven, and it's the first of two individual time trials at this year's race. 25.3 kilometers long and it's flat for the most part bar a short 1.5 kilometer climb around halfway through. This is the best chance for the pure TT specialists. After two relative days off, the GC riders will of course need to bring that A game too. 
Stage 8 then, and the sprinters should have their chance again here. After some rolling terrain at the start, the finish is perhaps better suited to a more versatile sprinter though, with a false flat run to the finish. The final stage prior to the first rest day begins and concludes in Troyes. And I've got to say, it just might be my favorite stage of the entire race. Because on the menu, a mini Strada Bianchi. 32 kilometers of gravel split into 14 sectors. There's potential for absolute carnage here. Two of those sectors were used at the Tour de France Femme avec Zwift last year. The race won't be won here, but it could well be lost. Anything could happen. Following what I reckon is a well-earned rest day, we have potential for wind, especially near the end of stage 10. But this is a good chance for the sprinters in saint armand Motron. Mark Cavendish won one of his 34 Tour de France stages here back in 2013. Maybe, just maybe, this is where he'll break that record. Or perhaps he'll have done so by this point already. Stage 11 is one of the most challenging of the entire Tour de France. It's long at 211k and climbing heavy with 4,350 meters of altitude gained. The most difficult slopes occur in the final 50k, with the Puy Marie and the Col de Pertus. The stage finishes in Le Lyon. Greg Van Avermaet won't be on the start line after retiring at the end of 2023, but this is where he crossed the line to take that epic breakaway victory in 2016, where he claimed the yellow jersey too. Stage 12 runs from Aurillac to villeneuve sur lot before the Tour de France makes its almost annual visit to Po on stage 13. This will be the 63rd time it's been used as an arrival city at the race. A variety of winners here in recent years include Julian Alaphilippe and Arnaud Demar in 2019 and 2018 respectively. This time it looks like it will be a sprint of some description. Poe continues to hog the Tour de France host cities by kicking off stage 14, the 67th occasion it will do so for a tricky stage in the Pyrenees. The riders will traverse the Col de Tourmalet before taking on the Hoquette d'Ancisson, then the Pla d'Ade, which is where Rafael Maika won in 2014 and Raymond Poulador achieved his final Tour victory in 1974. 3,900 meters of total altitude gained here, but that's nothing compared to the whopping 4,850 meters on the menu on stage 15. And it's a Pyrenean feast, featuring the Col de Perry sword before finishing on the Plateau de Bay, 16 kilometers at 8%. The winner's list on this climb is stellar in terms of prominent riders. Marco Pantani, Lance Armstrong, Alberto Contador, Joaquin Rodriguez, and Yella Van Den Dert. Okay, but my point is, the winner here is likely to be one of the biggest names in the sport. Once again, after ascending close to 9,000 meters in two days, I think the riders will have earned their final rest day, before an opportunity for the sprinters again en route to Nîmes. Nils Pollitt and Caleb Ewan are some of the recent winners here. Stage 17 is next, and it's all about the final 40 kilometers. The Col Bayard is first before the Col de Noye, which is seven and a half kilometers at more than 8%. The stage then finishes on the Super Devil Wee, which is slightly easier. So for me, this looks like it could be a chance for the breakaway. Steve Cummings won here by almost four minutes at the Criterium de Dauphiné in 2016, so maybe he can provide the Ineos Grenadiers with some particularly useful insight in his role as sports director. Gap hosts the start of stage 18, and the stage finishes with a fast descent into Barcelonette. And again, this could be a chance for the breakaway, particularly considering what is still to come for the GC riders. After setting off from Ombren, the riders will head over 2,000 meters altitude on three separate occasions. First with the Col de Var, and then the mighty Chima de Bonnet, which stands at an air throttling 2,800 meters above sea level. This road was actually built in the early 1960s with the goal of going higher than the Col de l'Isoran. And indeed, in 1962, it was included in the Tour de France route. The 145 km stage with 4,600 meters of altitude gained finishes on the Isola 2000, where Tony Rominger won ahead of Miguel Indrain all the way back in 1993. And so, on the first day of the final weekend, we arrive in Nice. It's the first time the city has hosted the finale of the Tour de France, and the first of the two stages here is similar to the type of terrain we've become accustomed to seeing on the final day of Paris-Nice each year. 
Only 133 kilometers, but there are four medium mountains to tackle. The Col de Brau, the Col de Torini, which is more of a full mountain than a medium mountain, to be honest, at 20 kilometers, the Col de la Comian, and finally, the Col de Coyol. Tadej Pogacar will have pleasant memories here of beating David Godou and Jonas Vinegar on these slopes at Paris-Nice in 2023. And finally, Unlike previous years, there will still be something to fight for amongst the GC riders on the 21st and final stage. For the first time since the famous 1989 edition, the race will conclude with a time trial, a mountain time trial at that. Starting in Monaco, they'll first climb La Turbie, then head onto the infamous Col d'Ez before swooping back into Nice, where the Tour de France will conclude on the Promenade des Anglais. At 35 kilometers, this is a really tough test. So let's keep our fingers crossed that the time gaps are relatively minor and there's potential for GC changes on that final day. We could well be in for a thrilling finale. What the move away from Champs-Élysées does mean is that there is very little reason for the sprinters to suffer through the full final week. Their final opportunity comes earlier on, and so the only reason to continue on is to help a teammate, or simply to say they've finished the Tour de France. I mean, that is of course an accomplishment, but I'd imagine it would be a lot harder for them to slog their way over the mountains without the prospect of a final sprint opportunity. So. My thoughts, this is a compelling route. We'll have no doubt a thrilling start in Italy before a huge Alpine test early, gravel mayhem before the end of week one, and a finish that could go down to the wire in Nice. Let me know in the comments, what do you make of the route and which riders will be particularly excited by it? Maybe that gravel stage in Troyes could be the chance for Tadej Pogacar to snatch back the Tour de France title. Just before we move on to the route for the Tour de France fam Avex Swift, a reminder that you'll be able to watch live and on-demand coverage of both races next year on GCM+. We'll be back with pre- and post-race breakaway shows, as well as a whole heap of extra content on the app, website and more. There will be the usual territory restrictions on those races, but we hope to have as many of you as possible joining us for the ride in 2024. Okay. Onto the third edition of the Tour de France fam Avex Zwift, and this route features some iconic locations for cycling fans. 946 kilometers across three nations, the Netherlands, Belgium, and of course France. The race will begin outside of France for the very first time. Worth noting that it doesn't start until Monday 12th of August, three weeks after the Tour de France concludes, pushed back, of course, due to the Paris Olympics. And like the men's race, its first ever foreign Grand Depart will be in the Netherlands, Rotterdam to be precise. To start, a pancake flat stage, so the sprinters will be eyeing the inaugural yellow jersey for sure. This means a particularly mouth-watering opportunity for the likes of Lorena Vibes, Charlotte Kuhl, and even Mariana Vos to wear yellow in their home nation. Then on Tuesday, an interesting proposition. Two stages in one day. Very exciting indeed. I'm going to call them stages two and three, even though I'd quite like to call them 2A and 2B. First up, a fiery 67 kilometers starting in Dordrecht before heading back to Rotterdam. And the sprinters should have another opportunity here. That is then followed later on by a 6.3 kilometer time trial around Rotterdam. They are the only TT kilometers in the race, but will be pivotal in shaping the early GC picture. Next, stage four, and it begins in Volkenberg. The riders will tackle the Kalberg of Amstel Gold Race fame before heading to the Arden capital, Liège. The riders have an Arden extravaganza on the cards here, taking on the likes of the Col de la Redoute and La Roche aux Faucons. This really is a mini Liège Baston Liège, and with 2,000 meters of elevation, the GC battle will surely spark into life here. Stage five then begins in Baston, and to me, this looks like it could be a real opportunity for the breakaway. The Côte de Montois la Montagne peaks with around 15 kilometers left, and then we have a 4% drag to the finish line. So unlikely to be a decisive day in the GC, and one many riders will be eyeing up as a unique chance. There are five categorized climbs on stage six to Morteau, and anything could happen here. When we take a look into the final weekend, I think this could be another one for the breakaway. From here, the stages only get harder. The penultimate stage is the longest of the entire race, and it's climbing galore. 
3,100 meters of altitude gains and concluding on Le Grand Bernard. Le Course hosted a memorable showdown here in 2018 between the now retired duo Annemiek van Vluten and Anna van der Breggen, who put more than a minute into every other rider that day. So obviously, this is going to be a massive GC day, but with one stage left, no matter the time gaps, it will still all be to play for. That's because the final stage features an eye-watering 3,900 meters of climbing, the most ever in a stage at the TDFF. The Col de Gladon is one of the toughest mountains in the Alps, but that's only the appetizer for the legendary Alp Duez. What's a way to finish the race? So, the race is front-loaded by three flat stages, a short time trial before we have two hilly days and two mountain stages to finish up. And it also means that like the men's race, we can't be sure who will win until the very end. Even if a rider is leading by minutes heading into that final stage, the gigantic climbing day means anything could still happen. So there you have it. All that's left to do is wait until next summer for the action to unfold. And I don't know about you, but I'm absolutely buzzing already. Let us know in the comments what you think of both routes and also who are your early favorites to win the yellow jersey. From me, it's au revoir for now.